All right, um, so now we're going to move on to talk about how to evaluate double integrals over general regions, right? So far, we've only really seen how to do this over rectangles. Um, so how does this work over a more general region? Well, the, the first thing to realize is that, you know, when we say general, we, we don't mean too general. Um, we do need our regi regions to be uh, closed, meaning they, uh, they include their boundary and bounded, meaning that, you know, they, they have a boundary. They don't go off to infinity, okay? Um, bounded is, is kind of the important bit here because if they're bounded, it does mean that, you know, you can take a region like this and you can fit it inside of a sufficiently large rectangle, okay? And so the idea is, well, we know how to do integrals over rectangles already. We know how to define them in terms of limits of Riemann sums. So let's try to, to define an integral over a general region um, as in terms of integrals over rectangles. So there are three types of regions that you encounter when you're doing double integrals, at least in terms of x and y. We're going to look at uh, other regions that are a little bit more interesting later on once we get to polar coordinates and, and eventually to general change of variables. Um, the, the first type here, this sort of so-called type 1, is, is a region where um, x runs between certain fixed values from a to b, as you can see here. Um, but y, rather than being bounded by constant values, y is, is bounded by um, variable values. Y, the, the bounds for y depend on x, right? So y runs from, say, g of x. up to h of x, okay? And type 2 is the other way around. Um, y is now bounded by, say, constant values c and d, while x runs between two, uh, two curves where we defined x as a function of y, right? So we might have, say, say g of y less than or equal to x less than or equal to h of y. Um, of course, this g and h don't necessarily have anything to do with that g and h. There's just there's only so many letters that seem to be nice letters for functions. Okay, um, and and you can do the same. I'm gonna only I'm only gonna draw one rectangle, but you can do the same thing um, here that you did there. Draw a rectangle around it. Um, the uh, the third type. Well, the third type is sort of the more interesting one. Um, the type 3 is, is really a way of saying that it's both type 1 and 2. And, and what that generally means is that the curves which bound your region, there might still be some straight lines in there, so there might be you know, one horizontal line or one vertical line in there. Um, but uh, the curves which bound your, bound your region, um, they're, they're one, they come from one-to-one -one functions, so, so they're invertible, right? We, can, we could write this as y equals h of x, but we could also write it as, as x equals h inverse of, of y. Uh, we could write y equals g of x, or we could write x equals um, g inverse of y. And, and now you have the, the option, right? Um, you could decide to say, well, hey, it looks like, you know, um, x goes from, from a to b, and then for each x value between a and b, uh, y goes between g of x and h of x. But you could also say that uh, y goes from, from c to d, and then for each y value between c and d, your x values well, okay, here I guess I've got a, this drawing is not great. I should have been a bit more careful um, because the, the limit on the x value depends on, on where you are. Um, okay, but that's actually not a bad lesson. This is something that's going to come up. We might have to divide this into two pieces, so it's not quite what we want. Um, so we might have to divide, we have to figure out, you know, this, this intermediate value here and, and say, okay, between, between, I don't know, C, D, E, no, E is Euler's number, F is a function, A and B are taken, uh, I don't know, let's call this um, R. So we might have to say something like, for Y between C and R, X goes between 
h inverse of y and g inverse of y. And then for y between r and d, x runs between, well, the lower limit is still h inverse of y. The upper limit is now b. So you might, have to, you might have to divide things up into two pieces like that. This can happen, right? Um, so OK, it's not quite type 3 if you've got to divide it up like that. Um, type 3 would be probably if I, had, if I had drawn this so that maybe this extended all the way up there and that extended like that. Um, so you could choose whether you wanted to kind of think of these curves as, as two curves that define y as a function of x or do you want to think of them as two curves that define x as a function of y, right? You have that flexibility, this freedom of choice to decide which way you want to do it. Um, these will be the more interesting ones, right? Because what's, what's interesting here compared to, to these is these are going to be ones where you do have that option when we're setting things up as iterated integrals, which way you want to go. That leaves the question, how do you set these up as iter iterated integrals, right? We know how to set things up if we're integrating over a rectangle, right? And, and so one of the ways that you do this is you kind of, you know, you have the bigger rectangle um, and, and you can do it that way. And what you really do is, is you define a new function. So, so given f of x, right, you would define, say, g of x. And, and you just define it like this. You say, okay, so somebody gave me this f of x, and that's the thing that I want to integrate, and I want to integrate it over this d. Well, I'll say that g, g should agree with f whenever x, y belongs to d. And I'm just going to set it equal to 0 whenever x, y doesn't belong to d. Um, this makes sure that only the points inside the region contribute to the integral, right? Uh, but this g of x, y, now we can define it on the whole rectangle, and so we can think of integrating g. Um, but nobody actually does this, right? We do this once to say, oh yeah, here's a thing we can do in a definition. And, and now we're going to think about how, how do we actually integrate this thing? Well, first of all, if I'm drawing my rectangle, I'm probably going to make it a little bit smaller, right? I'm probably going to cut it off like that because there's no point in including these points out here because my function is zero out there. So no, no, why, why would I do it? So x can run from a to b, right? So we're going to, and we're only going to integrate, you know, it's, it's f of x, y, right? So, so dy dx. We're going to do something like this. It's still going to be an iterated integral. Um, and now for each x value, what you can do is you say, okay, let's pick, a, let's pick an x value. Here's an x. And you think about integrating from kind of the bottom of the rectangle to the top of the rectangle. Well. You can do this bit here, but this bit is going to contribute 0, right? This bit up here is going to contribute 0. Right? So we could, we could do those bits, but they're not going to contribute anything. What we really care about is this piece here in the middle. And, and what are the limits for this, right? What are the sort of lower and upper integration limits for this line segment here? Well, it starts, right? The y values start at g of x. They end at h of x, right? So for a, for a fixed x value, y begins at g of x, and it ends at h of x. Okay? Um, so you set it up like that. If you wanted to kind of make sense and do things carefully, what you could do is you could, you could say maybe this is from c to d, right? You could say, well, I'm going to integrate from c to g of x, and then from g of x to h of x, and then from h of x to d, right? Think in terms of single integrals, we can break that up into three different integrals. Um, but two of those three integrals are equal to zero, so we don't bother writing them, we just keep the one in the middle, and that gives us the result, okay? Um, for type two, it's going to be the same sort of story, except we're going to integrate in the other order just because of the way the, the region is, is done, right? So, you know, when we were integrating over rectangles, we, we saw an example where we chose one particular order of integration because that just made the work easier. 
And it was sort of the function that dictated that order. But it might also be the case that the region you're integrating over, now that we're looking at more interesting regions, it might be the region that tells you how you should set up the integral, which one you should do first, right? So if you have a type 2 region, well, then you're going to want to do the x integral first because the limits with respect to x depend on y. And once you do that, you can integrate with respect to y, right? Notice that when you plug in the limits of integration, when you do the inner, the sort of inner integral in your iterated integral, um, you're going to be plugging in functions of y, right? So you're going to take this function or an antiderivative for that function. You're going to plug these things in. But what you're left with is going to be a function of y, and that's fine because you're still going to be integrating with respect to y. In the end, you should still be left with a number. Same thing here, right? In the first step, you plug in these functions of x, so you have something which now depends on x. Um, but then you integrate with respect to x from a to b, so you should have a number in the end, okay? Um, be careful when you're setting these up. Uh, the function dependence is always on the inner integral, never on the outer integral, because you still want to end up with a number in the end. You don't want to end up with a function. All right, so we're going to pause here because this video is already running a little bit long, and uh, we're going to come back and we're going to do this example here.